The more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. In the year 753 BCE, Romulus started the expansion and with it the growing influence of the city of Rome. During the first years of Romulus' his reign, the focus for Rome was only on a local level within the region of the Latium Plain. While Rome was busy challenging the patience of its neighboring cities, we can in the meantime move our attention towards the southeast. Because from the year 753 BCE, we now take a small leap forward and end up in the year 743 BCE. Here we find ourselves in a place in Europe that we know today as the country of Greece. Although in episode 1 we stated that we would not consider the so-called Dorian invasion of Greece as a starting point for our journey across the battlefields of Europe, this does not mean that the Dorians as a people are completely left out of our story. It is thought that long before the year 743 BCE, the Dorians colonized different areas in Greece. One such place was the region of Laconia, where the city of Sparta was founded. Laconia was part of the larger peninsula called the Peloponnese. The peninsula was divided into smaller city-states, with the region of Laconia sharing its borders on the left with the territory of Messenia. There was no love lost between the Spartans and the Messenians, and before the Messenian war started, there were already some skirmishes between both factions. This conflict found a large part of its origin in ethnic differences. The first spark was lit 25 years earlier, in 768 BCE. On the border crossing between Laconia and Messenia, inhabitants of both regions would go to the same temple to worship the goddess Artemis. Artemis was the goddess of the hunt, of wild animals and the wilderness. At night, when a Greek would look up at the night sky and see a crescent moon, he would visualize this as the crown of Artemis. Overall, Artemis was considered a popular goddess for the Messenian Greeks. It seems that this frequently visited temple therefore provided the perfect opportunity to settle some differences, which in the end led to both sides accusing the other of committing the first acts of hostility. From the perspective of the Spartans, it was the Messenians who attacked and killed the king of the Achaean line in Sparta, Telaclos, at the temple of Artemis. From the Messenians' perspective, it was the Spartans who, according to them, had sent beardless soldiers dressed up as women under the leadership of Telaclos in order to assassinate a large group of Messenian aristocracy. The Messenians, however, in their defense, were on to what happened, which led to the capture of the would-be assassins and as a punishment the killing of their leader, Telaclos. Either side of this story ends up with the death of Telaclos which was not forgotten by the Spartans. With more of these similar skirmishes further fueling the hatred for each other, the tensions were rising ever higher between the two regions. However, it wasn't until 743 BCE when the fire really ignited. Sparta had now once again lost more of its citizens to the Messenians since the first skirmish at the Temple of Artemis. And to them, this justified the decision of going to war. It was common in this period of history that the Greek cities would first provide a heraldic notification or some other warning before they would go to war with another city or city-state. This time though, Sparta believed that it was justified to go to war without any warning. Sparta felt that with all the wrongdoings of the Messenians, they had a valid reason to invade their neighbor. Although it's very likely that the true purpose for attacking Messenia was the need for Sparta to expand into more fertile territories. Part of the Spartan culture was to always have a strong and highly trained military force at the ready. The Spartan war machine therefore required a lot in its upkeep. Spartan leaders at the time noticed two important factors about Messenia. The first one was that the inhabitants of this region were less advanced in comparison to the Spartans, especially in the department of weaponry and general army upkeep. The second reason was the much more fertile land that could be confiscated by the Spartans would they have a reason to invade. This is probably what the local leaders of Sparta saw as a golden opportunity. They put the emphasis on the ethnic differences 
and highlighted some of the recent skirmishes that had taken place in order to get the support of the people of Sparta about the prospects of war. Therefore, in 743 BCE, Alcamenes gathered his Spartan army, marched into the territory of Messenia, where he ordered his soldiers to set up camp. The first target of the Spartans became the city of Amphia, a town close to the border with Sparta. With no warning given that Sparta was now on the path of total war, the city of Amphia became an easy prey. Marching in the darkness of night, the Spartan army reached the city gates, which had not been closed for the Messenians had no reason to feel threatened. Oblivious to what was going on, the people of Amphia only realized the direness of the situation when the Spartans entered their homes and started attacking everyone inside. The inhabitants of the city soon needed to flee for their lives. Anyone that didn't get away either didn't survive the night or was sold into slavery by the Spartans. After this relatively easy victory, it was decided that the town of Amphia was now to be turned into a garrison. From this new base of operations, the Spartans planned for further campaigning into the territory of Messenia. For the next two campaigning seasons, the Spartans could pretty much freely roam across the countryside of Messenia. In the meantime, the Messenian king was busy fortifying and garrisoning the remaining towns under his control. For now, he avoided any direct contact with the Spartan army. This made it easy for the Spartans to move uninterrupted across the country, confiscating anything of value that they could get their hands upon. Euphaeus, the king of Messenia, decided in 739 BCE, roughly four years after the Spartans had first invaded his territory, that it was finally time to meet his opponent on the field of battle. As the Spartans were denying the local population proper use of the fertile farming land, it was time to try and remove them from their base of operation in Amphia. With the Messenians marching towards the Spartans, the latter had noticed a large army on the Euphaeus and had sent for reinforcements to join them. When the army of Sparta, now under the command of Polydorus, caught up with their adversaries, Euphaeus decided to set up his fortified base on the edge of a ravine. With the ravine now in between himself and the Spartans, he then made sure that his enemy was unable to cross the river downstream and outflank the Messenians. When his fortified base was finished, it subsequently became very difficult for the Spartans to move past this new obstacle and into Messenian territory. In addition, the campaigning season was also coming to an end and both sides knew that a big battle would have to be fought during the next season. In the meantime, the Spartans sounded the retreat and went back home. The next year, both armies met on some unknown plains on Messenian territory, probably in close proximity to the city of Amphia. The Spartan army was made up of a small detachment of light infantry, with the bulk of the army consisting of heavy infantry. Additionally, the Spartans also had a group of Cretan archers available to them. Cretan archers were often selling their services to the highest bidder on the mainland of Greece. The Spartans had decided that they required the strategical advantage of ranged weaponry, as for a long time most regions on the mainland of Greece didn't really train in the skills of archery, as they didn't really believe in its effectiveness. The Messenians were less adept at warfare, and therefore the army was less divided into different groups with specific tasks. The battle lines were now in their respective formations, standing across from each other. For the Messenians, Euphaeus gave the command of the Messenian center to Cleonis, with Euphaeus himself commanding the left flank together with Antandros. A fourth commander in the form of Pythartos took command of the right flank. On the Spartan side, the center of the army was commanded by Eurylion, with Polydorus taking command of the left flank and Theopompus controlling the right flank. 
Today was no day of sneak attacks, small skirmishes or guerrilla warfare. This day both armies would face each other head on. As a signal is given on both sides, the armies are slowly moving towards each other. Tension is rising ever higher as the soldiers on both sides start to pick their target. Then the banging sound of steel weaponry fills the otherwise so peaceful countryside. From the moment the battle lines clashed into each other, it clearly showed that the Spartans are the more experienced of the two. Even to this day, we are still not sure if these specific Spartans already mastered the battle formation for which they would become famous, the well-known phalanx. But what can be assumed is that the Spartans fought with true discipline, the discipline of a people always ready for war. They easily held their own against the Messenians as they made sure to stay in a tight battle formation. The Spartans tried to get the army of Euphaeus to loosen up in their formation so that some soldiers could be singled out while slowly getting rid of the enemy. One by one, the soldiers on the Messenian side fell as the Spartans pushed them further backwards. As the relenting pressure kept on hammering down, it finally reached the breaking point whereby the remaining survivors routed back into the countryside. After this huge success, Polydorus now marched further into Messenian territory. The next part of how Sparta eventually captured the region of Messenia does have some question marks surrounding it. However, as the story goes, the Messenians did not want to suffer another major defeat as the one they had just witnessed. Therefore, the survivors sought refuge in the heavily fortified Mount Ithomi. The Messenians, running out of options, then asked for the help from the Oracle of Delphi. They wanted to know what had to be done to get rid of the invaders. According to the Oracle, a sacrifice had to be made, one of royal blood in order to get the gods on the side of the Messenians. Fearing the wrath of the Spartan army, the decision was made that they had to listen to the oracle. And so it came to be that the Messenian people chose to sacrifice the daughter of a Messenian hero called Aristodomus. When the news of the oracle's advice and the performed ritual sacrifice reached the Spartans, they were not willing to attack the city high up in the mountain. This unwillingness even lasted for several years out of fear for defying the oracle's counsel and the consequences of not respecting such dramatic sacrifice. But in the end, the need for new territories and the lust for expansion finally got the better of the Spartans. So once again, when the new campaigning season got underway, they went to war with Messenia. During the initial assault on the city, the Spartans managed to kill the king of Messenia, but were unable to fully capture the stronghold. This gave the Messenians time to now appoint Aristodomus as their new leader, who in turn promptly led a counter-assault on the Spartans. This took the Spartans by surprise, but they managed to keep the city under siege. Finally the Spartans decided that a prolonging of the siege of Ithomi was useless and then turned themselves to the oracle of Delphi for help. With the oracle willing to also give advice to the Spartans, the last bit of hope was lost on the side of the Messenians. They started to flee from the mountain, which made its defenses become weaker and weaker in the process. In the end, Aristodomus felt that the sacrifice that he had made was in vain and he committed suicide at the place where his daughter was buried. Now leaderless, Messenia fell in the hands of the Spartans. Any of the survivors were made to become so-called helots or slaves. They were now forced to work the land they had once owned and provide the necessary resources to keep the Spartan war machine going strong. <laughs>